Well, good evening to everyone, and I pray everyone had a blessed day. Um, we welcome you again to our Barnabas Ministry class, and of course, we give honor to our pastor in the person of Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, and we thank God for giving us the opportunity to serve you in this way. Well, for the last three weeks, or I say for the last two weeks, we've had the privilege of going over our 2022 curriculum, the disciple um, and the doctrine of Christ. And we're gonna continue in this vein tonight. We're gonna to start with the month of July and we're going to go right through August and prayerfully we will finish it because we have such great discussions. So for all of you who have also joined us on social media tonight, we welcome you. Well, in the month of July, we had Missionary Jewel teach from the overall theme of his impeccability. His impeccability. Now, this included lessons on Jesus as our high priest. She told us in one of the lessons to hold fast to the profession of our faith. She also taught about Jesus and our infirmities. And then lastly, she taught a lesson on yet without sin. So let's go back to this first lesson that Missionary Jewel taught about his impeccability. And it was really um, relating to Jesus as our great high priest. Now, Missionary Jewel defined this word impeccability for us because we don't necessarily use this word impeccability as a part of our biblical vocabulary. And she said that impeccable means not able to sin. And it comes from this word peccability, which was a false doctrine or teaching that Christ could sin. And then she posed a question to us. She said, was it possible for Christ to have sin? What's your answer? Raise your hand and tell me your answer. Was it possible for Christ to sin? Reverend Jackie? Never. Never. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Somebody says no in the chat. It's true. And guess what? Just don't take our, our, our opinion. Uh, she gave us the scripture that came from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. And I'll just read it in the NLT. Here begins God's word. For God made Christ, who never sinned. Look at that to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. So far the scripture. So it was not in God's nature to sin. She noted further that impeccability also means flawless, faultless, spotless, stainless, and perfect. So Jesus's impeccability is tied to his position as high priest, and she gave us the scripture coming from Hebrew chapter four, verse 14 through 16. Missionary Jew went on to describe the role of the high priest in scripture. Now, I wanna encourage everyone to go back to the playlist, to listen to all the lessons throughout the year, because what I am doing is I'm just pulling excerpts. Did I say excerpts? I'm not talking about the full lesson. I am taking excerpts from their PowerPoint, the words that they said, all right, just to review here tonight. So I'm encouraging everyone to go back over these PowerPoints and lessons because they're so rich, not only in the presentation, but in the content. So she described the role of the high priest in detail in scripture. And of course, when anybody ever talks about this, I really get excited because I was afforded the opportunity to teach blood covenant in BRCC. And it goes over this in detail. So whenever anybody teaches this, I just get excited, right? And so she said, and so what I'm saying here is, guess what? Jesus's assignment was to die to redeem mankind. So he had to be the spotless lamb of God. Any comments here? Missionary Jewel, you on? Anything that you want to bring out about this lesson or anybody else? Um, thank you, Pastor, for doing the rundown. Um, one thing I did want to bring out in the lesson um, is the importance of his impeccability. Because in order for us to be saved, he could not be found with any sin. Because remember, God 
God wanted a pure sacrifice. And oftentimes when we think of Christ's temptation, we often think that uh, there was no actual like um, resistance. But remember, this is Christ as fully God, fully man. So in his humanity, he showed us the ability to fully resist. And so a lot of the times what he did was show us that we too can resist. He showed us how to resist and that the fact that we can overcome, sometimes we fail to look at the fact that we can overcome temptation. We don't have to yield to it. And he gave us a, a template on how to do that. That's one thing I wanted to bring out. Thank you, Pastor. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, Reverend Jackie and then Lenata. Um, totally um, agree with uh, Jewel. You know, I was thinking about the question you asked earlier you know, about sin. And it's funny because that we all know that it goes against his character, right? Um, we have the scriptures that say in Numbers 23 and 19 that he's not a man that he should lie, neither the son of man that he should repent. And then we know that not only does he not lie, he doesn't sin, you know, he can't, you know? I mean, he's the God that's teaching us how to be, you know, true to our words. He is truth. You know, the Bible says he's the way to truth in the light. So, you know, he can't be a liar. He can't be a sinner. So, I mean, I just piggyback on Jew and just to make it simple and basic, it just totally go against his character. Absolutely. Lenata. Um, good evening, Pastor Diane. Good evening, everyone. Uh, one of the first things that I thought about um, when you were going over this lesson and it, it, you know, tails off of what the others have already shared, but the fact that this was his whole purpose, you know, his whole purpose of saying, prepare me a body was for him to be a spotless lamb. And so, you know, I think there's a proverb that says many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the counsel of God that's going to stand. So it was his predetermined counsel for Jesus to be a spotless lamb. So it was going to happen just period point blank. Like there was nothing that could happen to, frustrate God's eternal plan. Um, and so, yeah, that's what I thought about. Isn't that something? Nothing could frustrate his eternal plan, just like nothing can frustrate his plan for our lives. Same thing. I don't care how much opposition we face. That is good to know. So moving on, anybody else have a comment before I move on to another lesson that she taught? All right. So in class two, right, she encouraged us to hold fast to our profession. And she came from Hebrews 4.14, and I'll read it again in the New Living Translation. Here begins God's word. So then, since we have a great high priest who has entered heaven, Jesus, the son of God, let us hold firmly to what we believe. So far, the scripture. And she also gave us this definition of what profess means. It means to affirm or to announce something such as faith, to acknowledge, to profess ignorance, to profess belief in God. She gave us the imagery. Now I love also this imagery because anybody that knows me, I love anything to do with England and, and the late queen and anything just to do with England, London, anything to do with protocol, I love, and she gave us the imagery of the Royal Guards, right, in London regarding their stance, all right? And if you notice, if you watch anything with them, they are not moved by anything. I don't care if you walk in front of them. I don't care if you yell. I don't care if you try to get them attention to distract them. Their stance is solid. They do not even move their head. And it's a part of their protocol. It is a part of that belief system, that culture, that history that is ingrained in them. And I thought that was a, a powerful image here. So, you know, she gave us also, it also means this, they are not distracted from their assignment, unwavering in duty and commitment. And I'll let you guys comment in two seconds. She spoke about having this tight grip on the unstable perch. Now, Missionary Jewel, I couldn't really go into that because there was so much information. If y'all want to jump in on this, this was so great. All right. We are living in a time of instability, basically. I'm just piggybacking off of that, right? 
and with many belief systems, right? So she encouraged us to hold fast, to hold firmly to what we believe about Christ and his word, right? His word, we should uh, hold fast to it. We should believe it. We should declare it, right? And confess means to say the same thing. It means to agree with, right? And so Hebrews 2, 1 through 4 says this, and I like the New Living Translation because it just makes it simple. Verse 1, so we must listen very carefully to the truth we have heard, or we may drift away from it. Okay, so this was a cautionary note as well as encouragement to hold fast to our Christian faith and belief, and don't let anything loose us from being anchored in him and his word. Comments on this lesson about holding fast to the profession of our faith. Reverend Jackie. I was just thinking about the changing of the guards too. When um, I remember going to London and nothing you could do, they don't blink an eye. They don't, I mean, they, it's like a mannequin just standing there. And, um, and I look at my own life and I think when I'm on my post, how many things also come to distract me, what, what, whatever the post is, you know? And we're so easily distracted. A fly can fly by <laughs> and we just fly, go with the fly, then have to bring ourselves back. And I'm just thinking that, I think minister, I think she talked about the anchor of the soul. I think she showed that, I don't know, I, mean, I could be mixing up her lessons, but talking about the anchor of the soul, I think about the anchor. Um, when you throw the anchor out is to keep the, the boat or whatever at a standstill so it doesn't drift away. And sometimes I'm thinking, no, all the time I'm thanking God for Jesus being the anchor of my soul because the soul is always the thing that gets in trouble. You know, Pastor Angel used to sing the song, Water My Soul. And the word of God is what word of water is our soul. And for me, I just have to watch what is dangled before me. Even my own thoughts can distract me, right? Um, the circumstances around me can distract me. And, um, and then I could lose my focus and just drift away and have to bring myself in or have a friend, call a friend, you know that? So that's what I see in that area. Anyone else? Anyone else on this about holding tight to your faith? Uh, I see Lenata, then Missionary Jew. Um, for me personally, as I reflect on it, I think it's so important because we live in a world where you know, evil is waxing worse and worse. And um, I'm thinking about, there's a particular uh, Christian actress who has, you know, gone through some backlash kind of right now because of her Christian beliefs. You know, she, she spoke out against sin and, you know, the world didn't like it. And so the world is, you know, giving her backlash right now. But it's like, even though we may not be, in the public eye, you know, we still have a sphere of influence and it's still so important for us in our individual lives, not only for our own personal sanity and health and well being, um, but for our community, you know, to draw other souls into the, into the faith as well as the Lord has ordained. So it's just so important to hold fast because there are so many messages that say what is contrary to Jesus and what is contrary to the Bible. And so it's just so important to hold it tight, you know, so thank you. Excellent. Missionary Drew. Um, yes, Pastor, I'm um, Diane. What um, really prompted my memory is when um, Reverend Jackie started talking about drifting. One thing I learned in the study, when it comes to drifting, you're not aware you're drifting. If anybody has ever been in the ocean or been um, because I'm from the islands, you know, you go out and you're swimming and you're actually relaxing or you, you can float. And before you know it, because you're not been aware of your surroundings, you look up and the shore is far away and now you're trying to get back to the shore. So drifting sometimes come with ease, with comfort and being unaware of what's going on around you. So that's why holding fast becomes so pertinent in a Christian walk, because drifting can happen to any of us. Before you know it, you became complacent in your prayer. You missed one prayer or you missed two. You missed a day of reading. You say, I'm going to catch up tomorrow before you know it, a month or two have passed. The enemy is very subtle in the things he does. So he knows how to draw us away with subtle things. So that's one thing I remember when um, Reverend Jackie was talking. 
That's 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 excellent. That's excellent. Charles Stanley often does lessons and sessions on drifting and how easy it is for us to drift. You know, listen, and it is easy. It is easy, and, and you don't even know how you got to the place where you are. And you sometimes you say, "How did I get here? How did I get here?" Sometimes you can be so distracted you don't even know how you got there. But thank God He can always pull us back. Thank God. He always makes a way for us to come back, Reverend Jackie, uh, Reverend Laverne, and then let me call Reverend Jackie. Yes, good evening, everybody. Um, I was just thinking about, you know, yes, drifting, but also, and, and I guess that's in going together with uh, holding fast your faith today, because um, I was just listening to, um, uh, I don't some debates or something in the government regarding uh, same-sex marriage, and there is one Republican uh, man who is um, a steadfast Christian. That's what he says, and he's always voted against same-sex marriage. Always. Now, all of a sudden, his son has come out to be gay, and now he's revisiting what he was. Uh, you know, was so against as far as gay marriage. And now he doesn't got onto the bandwagon of uh, saying maybe nothing is, is wrong with that. So he compromised, you know, and today a lot of Christians are doing that when it hit, when it hits home to them, are you going to choose, you know, your family, your friends or whatever over the word of God? And in this case, I'm saying to, I'm, I don't know, I don't know anything about it, but I'm saying to myself, was he really saved? Was this man really, really saved that he just all of a sudden turned on a dime and now he's for gay marriage. He's revisiting it and he's going to vote now for them to um, be able to get married because of his son now has come out the closet. So is, is it, you know, let me, let me just answer that before Reverend Jackie. It's really not a question of whether or not he's saved or not, because we cannot make that determination. It's not that. Sometime when the pressure hits home and in these types of arenas, we have to always remember that it's about power. It's about money. It, it, listen, I, I, I can't call names because I don't want to call names on here. But if you just look at the news and if you look at what's going on, certain people are still loyal to one man. Why are they still loyal to some man who is a past thought? You know, why are people, these powerful people still loyal to one man, even though they know this is just as off as all whatever, but they're still loyal, even though, guess what? They don't necessarily believe what he's saying is true, yet they're still loyal. Why? You see, because when it comes home, they have personal agendas that they, you know, are trying to get across. People are running for office. They don't want to rock a bowl. You, you see what I'm saying? So it's not the question of whether or not that man is saved or not, because we can't make a determination as to whether who is saved or who is not saved. But when it comes home, there's a whole lot of other dynamics like that that are working, and especially in those high offices. So I just want to say that. And you know, it happens a lot. It happens a lot. Reverend Jackie, then we'll move on. Yes, um, Pastor Diane, somebody sent me a story today and I'm, talking, I'm still stuck on this part about, you know, um, so easily distracted and drifting and um, people, so many things can take it, whether it's pain, death in the family, many, you know, the pandemic. And the story that they sent me, you may have heard about it, is um, Sister Lee in the earthquake. And this is a true story that happened in China. And it was a pastor named Pastor Lee who was preaching the gospel, but got arrested because he preached the gospel. But while he was in prison, and I'm just, you know, paraphrasing a long story, but while he was in prison, um, they, they worked him really hard. A lot of things happened to him. He ended up dying in prison. He had five kids and of his five kids, the oldest was 12 years old, a girl. The young girl, um, they, they had to eat. They didn't have any food. They were poor and they had a newborn baby as well. 
And so she went to the very prison that overworked her father and, and he died there and she asked for a job there. And they gave her a job and, and they told her, you see this red button right here? All you have to do is sit here and press this one red button when you hear us tell you to press the button. So every time she heard them press, say press the button, she pressed the button. Um, but this one particular day, just shortening up the story, she heard a voice say, press the button, right? But she didn't see anybody. And if she heard the voice again, press the button, but she didn't see anybody. And she pressed the button. And the people that, you know, once she pressed the button, the end of the, show, the story is um, the man came out, the director came out and asked her what made her press the button when they had not given her the order. And she heard God say, press the button. She was a Christian, heard God say, press the button. And it saved a lot of people. And they said a whole lot of people as a result of that came to know Christ. I mean, I'm shortening up the story, but I'm gonna send it to you so you can read it for yourself. I know you like to read these things. The bottom line is that this young girl, they could, she, she could have became a prostitute. She could have sold her body just to feed her family. She could have lost focus. She could have even got angry with God and say, I don't wanna serve this God. And, and, and her father was a pastor. So I'm just saying so many things like this takes us off course. You know, death in the family. I don't wanna serve God. Why do you let my husband die? Why do you let my wife die? Why do you let my mother die? And it just is a distraction to make us uh, uh, charge God foolishly and take us off our course with him. I don't know if this matches everything, but that's, I feel like that story kind of does. Yeah, that's a wonderful story. That's a wonderful story about just following God through whatever, through whatever opposition. Listen, saints, the time, you know, we don't know persecution like some of these uh, countries that are facing. And sometimes because it's not close like that, we seem to think it cannot get that close. But I'm telling you, God is preparing us. We're in the end time and God is preparing us even more. That's why he's encouraging us to be a community in unity. You're going to hear that. A community that rallies around one another because we're going to need one another like that. So thank you for that story. I'm going to move on now to August with Reverend Crystal Payne, who taught about his death. And of course, this included speaking about his death, uh, Matthew 16, 21 through 23. And she taught about also sacrificial language. And it was in two lessons, part one and two. And then she ended with a lesson called Christ Loves Us, right? So in one of, one of the things that I just want to bring out here, because we have to keep moving, is... Um, the sacrificial language lesson. And she defined sacrifice as the act of offering to a deity, something precious, also the destruction or surrender of something for the sake of another. And the words that she discussed, which really depict the language of sacrifice were minister, the word ransom and reconciliation. Ransom, Matthew 20, 28, even as the son of man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, which also means to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. She gave us the definition of the word ransom, which means to loose, a price paid for redeeming captives, freeing them from bonds and setting them at liberty. Of course, it applies spiritually to the ransom paid by Christ for delivering man from the bondage of sin and death. Now, even though we don't have to die physically like Christ, right? We know that, we don't, we know that, but we have to die to our flesh daily. I'm asking you this question, can or do we give our lives sacrificially to someone or something else without being on our own terms? Can we do that? Sila, can we and do we do that? Because we sacrifice, but it's usually on our terms. Ask that question again, Pastor D. Can we or do we give our lives sacrificially to someone or something else without it being on our own terms? All right, Missionary Jewel, Lenata, here we go. Well, I would have to say, um, it's a challenge because as long as we are in this flesh, we will always have a portion that we keep for ourselves. So even though in our 
um, intent. Our intent is to be some part of that we always hold for ourselves. So I feel like as long as we're close in this flesh, we will always hold back a little piece for ourselves. Always a little piece of the pie. So when people look at it on the surface, right? Even when you take somebody like a Mother Teresa, where she gave so much for her, for others, she will tell you at the end of her days, there was still some satisfaction that she got out of it. It was never all a fully turning over to God, all she did. Yeah, so you're saying we're not all that altruistic after all, huh? Yeah, okay. All right, <laughs> Sister Lenata. Um, further question, can we? I believe the answer is yes, we can, not based on our own power, but through Jesus Christ, um, because he said his grace is sufficient. So, you know, and we have the Holy Spirit who, in, who has endued us with power. So I, I believe that we have the ability to. Now, do we? I can't speak for everybody else, but I, for me, the answer to that is no. Um, and I, I was reminded of Reverend Katrina, I don't remember if she was teaching transformation or catechism years and years ago, but she was um, quoting a devotion, I think, from Charles Spurgeon. And it talks about how even when we're trying to worship God or doing outward things that appear to be worship to God, man always has a side view of himself and wants to look at himself. Um, and so to me, I, and we can't see, we can't see people's hearts. We, our hearts deceive even us. So I think that can we, yes, do we, or does Lenata know because of um, my sin nature, but thanks be to God, you know, he lives within us and he's sanctifying me, but in practicality, no, I don't do that. I don't love like that. Good. That's, that's a great answer. Okay. Uh, Reverend Laverne. And then Reverend Jackie, and then we'll move on. I, I just want to say, yes, it can be done. And I'm a living witness because um, God had given me Yasmin. And this friendship has been for over about 25 years. And I'm going to tell you something. It's God kills two birds with one stone. Because a lot, he said to me, not only did I bring her for you, uh, for her, but I also bought her for you. There were things that were in me that she brought out. And God said, I don't like that. You're not kind or you're not compassionate. I don't like the way you spoke to her and stuff that was in me that I, I never knew and never thought would ever come out of me. She brought it out in situations that, you know, when we rubbed heads together. And, and because of that, I now watch my tone, I watch my voice, and, and, and I, I just watch certain things because the Lord had told me one time, he says, you're not kind. I said, I'm not kind. He said, no, you're not a kind person. And he says, my son is kind and I'm a kind God and I want you to be kind. That girl helps me to be kind, you know? She helps me. And, and even though there's some things I'm still dealing with her, she ain't gotten years, but the other, there are other things that she has changed as well. So iron sharpens iron. And, you know, this is certainly, uh, um, this is a long, you know, friendship over 20 years and, and still going, but yes, it is a sanctify, a sanctification process that we, um, you know, help each other to sanctify each other. So um, wonderful. That's that's it can great. Happen. Yes, Thanks. yes, it can happen. Reverend Jackie, Pastor Diane. Uh huh. Um, <laughs> okay. Um, I heard everybody's response, and it kind of like made me think that your question went above my head because I think the devil don't want me to be honest about it. So can you repeat it one more time? <laughs> No, basically, can we say that we can give sacrificially, right, to someone or something without it being on our own terms, basically? Because without remember, it, with sacrifice, something has to die. Something right. always has to die. Right. Ah, ah. Okay. So well, let me let me let me keep it let me keep it real. 
let me keep it totally real. And this is a, tr this is a transformation class really, even though it's Barnabas, but you know, over, you know, um, Pastor Diane, yes, it can be done, but I think Lenata hit it to thy own self be true. And it, because I have done many things straight from my heart, right? Not, I thought that I wasn't looking for anything in return. I thought it was sacrificial. And then when I was overlooked by the people I did it for, which it was supposed to be purely from the heart, I began to take tag, tabs on what I did. Started making a litany of, I did this and I did that for them. And, and it, it started out pure. And it started out in my mind that I never was looking for something, but you got to be honest because when you didn't get the tap tap on the shoulder or, or you did it for years and then all of a sudden new Jack come and new Jack got, you know, recognition on it. And you did it for 15 years. You, I have to check my heart now because now my heart says, you know, yeah, I did it from my heart, but no, you didn't because look at how I'm getting all bent out of shape. So I really have to check myself, Pastor Diane. Can it be done? Laverne say, yes, it can be. But I really think that every individual need to take introspect of themselves and actually see where they are with that because just when you thought it was okay, I thought it was okay. I mean, today I'm putting a check in my spirit that I don't go out of control and to the left with it. Now, when I do it, I have to check my motive for why I do it and be like somebody says, soon somebody asks you something, don't give a quick answer right away. Say, can I get back to you on that one? Because we say yes right away, and then we do it and kick ourselves in the butt and say, I really didn't want to do it. And then we half-heartedly do it. Then we're looking for some kind of reward, some kind of way. So I don't know. I hope I answered your question. Yes, no, that's 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 very good, uh, Reverend Jackson. Somebody help me. There was a movie out, I think it was Al Pacino, and it was about the devil and the lawyer and his wife was pregnant and he was he got him to work for him what was the name of that movie was that the devil's advocate was it the devil's yeah, advocate yeah yes also, it was okay so i'll take a i'll take a i'll launch out here for y'all to cut me up um just because <laughs> of the devil <laughs> just because of the movie the devil's advocate i'll say no it can't be done one of the things i remember that's the name of the movie is that as he went through the movie the reason why he kept getting that lawyer guy is because he always did something for himself. He always had a desire for something for himself. And no matter what went on, even when it came to his wife not spending time, I think she was pregnant or something, all, all kinds of craziness was going on. And then at the end of the movie, he realized what was really happening. So when he went to court this time, he was trying to do the right thing. And he still caught him another way. As long as we operate out of this flesh with this wicked heart, we're going to always, always, in some kind of way, find a way to do something for ourselves. Mm -hmm. And no matter how much we call ourselves giving, being charitable, being loving, being it's always the enemy will always find a little corner of something that we really was holding on to and that's why we did it we, we're never gonna totally sacrifice ourselves because it's just not in us to do it so the lord covers us with that though. Christ. we thank god because he covers us in that area but this this flesh just you know the heart is wicked and it hides from us and sometimes you do things you didn't even know was in your heart. Absolutely. Or something comes about and you know what it really takes for somebody to say, you do something nice. You'd be like, I did this just for you. And let that person look at you like, you don't do nothing for nobody. And then your whole attitude changes. <laughs> Why? True. Because it was never just for you. It was something that you had in there that you was benefiting from it. If it was just to feel good that you did something for somebody else. So my answer is no. Well, that's why the that's why I I well okay I'm I'm with you a little bit, but I'm not with you. I think it's I think we are able to do it, like you said, through in the flesh we cannot, 
If we don't die daily, we cannot. The Bible tells us we got to die daily and that's a part of the sanctification process in our lives. So it can be done. It, this kind of sacrificial loving can be done. This kind of kindness can be done. It can be displayed, but guess what? We have to die daily. And that's the part we don't wanna do. It can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit, through his word, but we don't wanna die. And, that, and that's the whole point. We don't wanna die daily, y'all. Sorry. That, that, and that's where it is, because it can be done. We can be kind to one another, but guess what? I have to think it. I have to be intentional to be kind to you. I have to be intentional to speak well of you. I have to be intentional. And that's a part of my dying daily. That's a part of dying daily. And that's why we got to beat down this flesh because this flesh is always going to rise. Now, y'all know we can stay here all night, all day, all evening, all week. I'm just going to take Sister Sheila and Reverend Crystal, and that's going to be the last one for this, and then I'll move on. Wonderful, wonderful answers. Help us, Lord. Uh, um, good evening, family. Um, I was going to say that um, there are times when the Holy Spirit enables us to do it in, at certain times in certain areas. And it's not that we don't revert back, but it's just that in that time when we yield and the ability and the grace to do it is there, it can be done. But it is still a walk and a sanctification process because it's not consistent. Amen. Um, Reverend Crystal, did I see your hand? Yes, ma'am. Good evening, everyone. I apologize uh, for my camera being off today. I was, Pastor Diane, you really kind of hit it on the head what I was going to say. I just wanted to make sure I, I had understood the question because, you know, you know, we, I, I agree with you. Um, if, if God, it really depends on what our goals are, because there's so many examples in the natural, in my opinion, in which we do things on someone else's terms. Say, if I go, if I pursue a doctorate from an Ivy League institution, I'm going to submit to their terms and conditions and put my flesh under for the sake of the goal. Not saying that it wouldn't be self-serving, but I'm going to do what they tell me to do on their terms. Why? Because of the outcome is desire. The outcome is desirable for me. And, and that's, you know, I just wanted to be careful not to, yes, we have a sin nature. Yes, we do live in this flesh. No, our flesh does not. It is hostile towards God. It does not want God. It is an active enemy of God, but if godliness with contentment is great gain, if we're following in the steps of Jesus, my meat is to do the will of him who sent me. Then if our ultimate goal is to please the Lord, then, and we have the help with the Holy Spirit, then yes, we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. So that's all, um, but you had already kind of touched on that. Yeah, that, no, that's wonderful. Thank you for that. Okay, we're moving. So here in September, we had Reverend Laverne teaching about the resurrection. And I just, you know, want to deal. She talked about the evidence. She talked about Christ having a flesh and blood body. She talked about the significance of the resurrection, right? And she gave us scriptures here. And she gave us in terms of the evidence about the angel and the women at the empty tomb in Matthew 28, 9 and 10, right? Where, you know, Jesus met them and uh, you know, they, she, Jesus tells them, you know, behold, you know, all hail, and they held him by the foot and they worshiped him, right? He said, go tell my brethren to go to Galilee and it's there that they're going to see me, right? So they had evidence, right? And then of course we had, he had a flesh and blessed body, John 20, 26 through 29. This is what I really like and I want to deal with in, um, Verse 20 and 27, then saith he to Thomas, reach here thy finger and behold my hands, reach here thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. Verse 28, and Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. Now, remember, if you go back in that same chapter, verses 24, 25, Thomas was called Didymus and that name means twin, all right, or it means double. He didn't have a twin brother, y'all. Thomas didn't have a twin brother, but he was double-minded in this situation concerning his faith. 
And if we're all honest, a lot of times we are double-minded concerning our faith. We all waver from time to time in our faith. And that's why Jesus said, don't be faithless now, but be believing, right? And so the evidence was there at the tomb. The evidence was there in his flesh and blood body. Why is this important really quick about the evidence in the flesh and blood body? Why, why would this be important? That we have evidence of the resurrection, that we have evidence that Jesus had a flesh and blood body. Why is that important, Lenata? Um, for the flesh and blood part, because um, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So if he didn't have blood to shed, then our sins would not be remitted. And that's that's the foundation of the gospel. Okay, Reverend Jackie, I saw your hand. I just thought about little Josh Braxton when we were in the church and he talked about the dirty bird, the, the dirty blood. Um, his blood is efficacious. It just, I mean, his blood is powerful. Um, the blood is what covers our sins. So I piggyback off of Lenata. There's so much to say about the blood. Okay, that, that's very good. Was there any teachings floating around that said that Jesus didn't come in the flesh and that, that, it, that it was he had a body, it was the appearance of a body? Do y'all, re- okay, I see yes, right? So there were teachings that were going around saying that he did not appear in the flesh. That's why it says in John 1, 14, and the flesh, right, dwelt among us, right? And we beheld his glory, the only begotten of the father, full of grace and truth. Because there were teachings going around saying that he didn't have a flesh and blood body. And he did. So that's, you know, so the lesson that Reverend Laverne taught here on his resurrection, the evidence at the tomb, Jesus meeting the women at the tomb, and she gave so many other scriptures, all right? He had a flesh and blood body and the significance. It's very important to combat these heresies of today because, again, the whole thing, y'all, is to redefine Jesus. The whole thing now, I'm telling you, I can't even mention that. There's a little campaign. I don't want to mention it. It's going around about Jesus, but it only focuses on his compassion, social justice. I don't see anything there that Jesus died for our sin. (laughs) I don't see anything on that website that says he died for your sin. They have the appropriate scriptures there in place, but guess what? They're leaving it up to the people to redefine the scriptures instead of bringing clarity to the scriptures that they are giving. So this is, this is very slick, y'all. And that's why it's important to hold fast to our faith and to the word of God. Did I see your hand, Reverend Jackson? The other thing that we have to remember, the importance of him being flesh and blood and sacrificing on the cross for our sins. He couldn't come as God and sacrifice. He couldn't come as a spirit. He had to be the second Adam. He had to be a man. Yes, yes. It was a man that put us in this situation and it had to be a man and flesh and blood that took us out of the situation. So he Excellent. needed to be flesh and blood in order to go to the cross to die for our sins. Wonderful. That's excellent. Okay, moving. Lastly, I just want to touch on Reverend Doreen. Reverend Doreen taught about the ascension, right? And uh, she taught us about the characteristics of the ascension. The significance, part one and two, she talked about John the Baptist being the forerunner of Jesus. And of course, she talked about his high priestly ministry office and that Christ is the head of his church, right? And so she talked about the characteristics in Acts 1, 9 through 11. And she talked about some key words there, like phrases like taken up, looking toward heaven, this same Jesus in like manner as you will see him go up. Why was this so important? because the second coming of Christ, like the ascension, will be personal, visible, and he's gonna return to the Mount of Olives. And of course, she talked about Jesus being the head of the church, which is very important. So again, you know, there was a lot of information, y'all, that was given in these classes. And again, um, I'm encouraging not only the teacher, but to all those who are listening on social media to go back to our playlist from January. Okay, and you'll be able to view all of the classes there in terms of the disciple and the doctrine of Christ. And if you have missed any lessons, like I said, just go back, hit the playlist. They'll be there for you. Or you can always email us at Barnabas 
at BethRafa.org with any comments or questions. Now, no, I have to say this, um, we will not have class again to Wednesday, January 11th, 2023 at 7 p.m. Again, we will not have class again until Wednesday, January 11th. And our curriculum for 2023 will be relationship with Christ through Old Testament biblical characters. And you don't want to miss it. I cannot wait to see what the teachers are going to bring out about these Old Testament biblical characters. So until then, on behalf of our pastor, Bishop Jacqueline E. McCullough, have a blessed and Merry Christmas, and God willing, we will see you in the new year. God bless you.